Let me show first how the field has uh, developed in the last uh, years, and this has been thanks to a new, uh, the, the development of new technology, new sequencing technologies that were not available before 2005. So the first retrieval of a very short mitochondrial DNA sequence uh, was achieved in 1997 from a, a Neanderthal bone. And then during about 15 years, we were constricted to retrieve these short fragments of sequences, sometimes uh, some genes, some nuclear sequences, until we were able to retrieve complete genomes. And this happened uh, thanks to these new sequencing technologies. And in 2010, we retrieved three complete genomes. The first complete genome from an ancient modern human who was a... Uh, uh, the SAC uh, genome, a person from Greenland, which is only 4,000 years old. The first complete genome from a Neanderthal, a next in human. We'll talk now about the, the Neanderthals. And the complete genome of another next in hominin that we call Denisovans, and we still don't know what they are. And then suddenly, uh, as you can see, the, the whole thing ends up in 2010. But then suddenly we start getting more and more ancient genomes and in fact, we have created a whole uh, scientific field that we can uh, call paleogenomics. So it's the retrieval, as, uh, analysis, and a study of complete ancient genome from uh, ancient hominins or, uh, or humans from the past. This is a short list. I stop uh, now because in 2014, 2015, uh, the, the whole thing has become exponential, exponential, and we have now 233 ancient genomes. Uh, but I'm showing you the chronologies and also, oh, and also the, the coverage. Of course, the quality of the genome depends on the coverage. The coverage uh, is the number of copies you get from the whole genome. The whole genome, as you know, the whole human genome is about uh, 3.2 uh, thousand million nucleotides. So it's a lot of information, and it's, of course, uh, quite complicated to get all this, uh, all this information, and, all, and, of course, to analyze all this information. As you can see, we have now a high coverage genome from a Neanderthal from the Altai Mountains, and we have also a high coverage genome from uh, these Denisovans we are going to talk later on. But also we have been gathering some ancient genomes, some of them I uh, retrieved myself, like the first Mesolithic genome from Europe, when, when the Europeans were hunter-gatherers, and we'll talk also later on about that, Neolithic um, European genomes, and, uh, and now we are moving more and more to the present. We are obtaining Bronze Age, Copper Age, and now we are uh, still unpublished, but there are Roman genomes and, and Middle Age genomes from uh, Europe and eventually from all the, co the continents. Uh, before that, before, so uh, just uh, five years ago, if we wanted to understand ourselves by studying the genomes, we only could compare with, with our uh, closest relative, which is the chimp, uh, and we had to, uh, to check both genomes to try to find which genes have changed in the hominin lineage and therefore which genes can define ourselves in, in our uniqueness. And of course this is quite complex because we know already from the fossil record that the hominin tree is uh, very bushy with lots of branches, some of, uh, you know, all of them have died out except ourselves. We are the only human species of the uh, of the complex hominin tree that uh, we have, uh, you know, we are present right now. Uh, and of course, this has happened in the last six to seven million years. And therefore, it's very complex to understand if we found differences between chimpanzees and modern humans, uh, what really has happened when this has happened. And if we got the possibility of a study, at least the Neanderthal genome, which was one of the latest branches that became extinct just a few tens of thousands years ago, we will be able to understand at least what has happened in the very last uh, branches of this, of this hominin tree. This is the Neanderthal wall. Uh, Europe was not 
a place, well, it was kind of a nasty place, I have to say, in the middle place to see. It was not a place where uh, hominin would like to come, not like, not like today. Uh, you could see that in the glacial maximums, all the north of the continent was covered with ice sheets. And what was not covered by ice was uh, a kind of a tundra uh, or a step, cold step environment, similar to the environment we can find uh, nowadays in Siberia. So uh, it's obvious that for a human adapting and living in those conditions, these are very cold conditions, we have to be able to find some adaptations in the genome of these, in, of these archaic hominins. Adaptations at least to cold conditions, also adaptations probably to a very uh, caloric and hypercaloric diet, yeah, meta metabolic adaptations, maybe also pa adaptations to pathogens that were not present in Africa but were present in these high latitude conditions, maybe adaptations to circadian rims that doesn't exist in, in, in tropical environments. How do they look? How were the Neanderthals? And uh, I just gathered uh, three dif four different depictions uh, to show you how along the last 100 years, the idea we have about Neanderthals have been evolving, which is funny because they are extinct, of course, and they are not evolving anymore. Um, but it's clearly what is showing that what is evolving here is our perception of ourselves and our perception of the diversity in the past. If you look at the oldest representations in the left uh, corner, you will see at the beginning of the 20th century, the Neanderthal is considered something like a brutish, primitive, uh, almost like a gorilla, someone who is uh, hiding behind, behind, uh, behind a corner, no, waiting for, for someone with a stick. Uh, in the 1950s, which is in the, in the left upper corner, the Neanderthal is, looks slightly better, but not much, I would say. Uh, he still has some uh, signals of uh, primitivism. But then uh, in the 80s, on the, on the right uh, lower corner, you can see the Neanderthals are still evolving, and now they are becoming more friendly and more like us. And like in all marketing things, you have to pay attention to the details. They seem to be speaking. There are childs. The, the child has the hands on the shoulders of the father. The, you know, the environment is much nicer than like cooking a barbecue uh, and they look happy. And now in the 90s, in the upper right corner, the Neanderthals are, you know, still getting more and more like us. And, and to me, it, you know, he, it, this Neanderthal it looks a bit, like, a bit like Bob Gandalf, I would say, you know? And this is one of the very last reconstructions. I was an advisor for this one. It was published in the front cover of the National Geographic. Um, I think seven years ago. And just to show you how our stereotypes are still um, posing problems in the, in the understanding of these uh, past human beings. For instance, we had discovered in that time that some Neanderthals uh, had red hair because we were able to retrieve the gene which is involved in the red hair in modern humans and we found a specific Neanderthal mutation that had a similar phenotypic effect uh, like the mutations that produce red hair in modern humans, but a different one. Um, but then the, the people who did the reconstruction for National Geographic uh, asked me, uh, you know, they, they put him a blue eyes colors, and the mutation that produces the blue eyes in all modern humans is a specific mutation which is much more recent uh, than the extinction of the Neanderthals, and is always the same mutation. So everyone who is in this room and has blue eyes, you know, they, 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 you, they are sharing this fragment of chromosome, at least. So, you know, if this helps you, then just go into contact. Um, but then I told the people in the National Geographic, listen, this mutation is too recent. What I am saying is that they had red hair, but they didn't have blue eyes. They had dark eyes. But for the Anglo-Saxon people, they, both things usually go together, not like here, but in North uh, Europe. And they were a bit shocked and said, no, no, you know, it's strange, no? Red hair and dark eyes, it doesn't quite fit. So what about green eyes? <laughs> well, <laughs> so that's the reason the reconstruction has green eyes. In my view, just a, a mistake. 
How do they wear uh, in terms of a skeletal morphology? They were spectacular. They were much stronger than us. You know, a Neanderthal, just imagine fighting with a Neanderthal and you will, and you will be destroyed. They were incredibly powerful, uh, strong. They had different things in some skeletal uh, proportions. And of course, the skull is also very different from our skull. Uh, and this also has to have some translation in the genomes. So we, if we are able to study the genomes of the Neanderthals and ourselves, we should be able to find also some difference in, in, in the skeletal morphology. On the other hand, they have things that um, imply a kind of modern symbolic behavior. Uh, for instance, these are some recent findings on pigments uh, so Neanderthals had some kind of uh, or body ornaments. They, they have some uh, conceptions on, on, on this thing, which is, of course, very, very new from a symbolic point of view. They cut some bones in the raptors in the sides to apparently uh, collect the feathers. So that the, the, this came all these depictions of Neanderthals a bit like Sioux now. On the other hand, the wall died out when our ancestors in the Upper Paleolithic went into Europe from the, from the out of Africa migration, and about 40,000, 45,000 years ago, they spread over Europe, and the last pockets of Neanderthals became isolated in different places, and they disappeared. So as a human group, their technology and their physique, uh, and, and, and as a biological entity, they disappeared about 30 something thousand years ago. And of course, the people that came and replaced the Neanderthals, they had things uh, that we can perceive as a very modern like, a very uh, human modern like, and Neander Neanderthals didn't have. But we still don't know if that means something in terms of cognition. For instance, they had this figurative art. They, they, you can see these paintings from the cave of Chauvet, which is more than 30,000 years ago. There's fantastic depictions of these cave uh, lions. Uh, uh, Europe was still a nasty place to be. It was full of uh, dangerous animals. And you can see there's a sculpture also 30,000 years ago who has the body of a human but the head of a lion. Again, a lion it probably was a big problem in those times. So uh, we don't know what does it mean, but it clearly has a very... Uh, let's say, complex symbolic uh, meaning. We don't know if Neander Neanderthals were able to do these things. Uh, some think they were not. But on the other hand, if you think on that, maybe they didn't have free time. And you know, it looks like uh, ridiculous, but for being painting in the cave, you need a social structure where some people go hunting for you, and you have, you know, this, I am finishing, I am finishing these lions, bring me the foot at home. So uh, maybe we are seeing here just a different demographic structure. In conclusion, uh, studying Neanderthals is very much study about studying ourselves. The first Neanderthal genome was achieved by the analysis of three different bones from this beautiful cave in Croatia. And of course, one of the very best, uh, easiest thing uh, you can do when you have this genome is compare which genes are different in modern humans and which genes are different in Neanderthals, and therefore make a list of genes that have changed uh, since both uh, lineages have diverged. And this was achieved very easily, but on the other hand, the list is quite short. We have about 80 genes with amino acid differences between modern humans and Neanderthals. And when we look at this list, this is a, just a short list, uh, of course we see many different things, but we still don't know how to interpret that. It's very difficult to know what the gene is doing exactly. Uh, you know, it's very easy to do to understand what happens when a gene fails. It produces a phenotype, usually a disease or something. So we know that some genes that are different in modern humans and Neanderthals are involved in cognition or in things in the brain because uh, they have been related to schizophrenia, autism, and other, uh, and other uh, disorders. But we don't know exactly what does translate in terms of Neanderthals being different to modern humans. 
and some other things that we still don't understand. For instance, a, a protein that is involved in the movement of the sperm. We don't know if this is something or is nothing. So, of course, there is a lot of work in the future to try to understand the functional effect of these proteins. Another thing we have been able to, to do is to retrieve three complete exomes from three Neanderthals. Exome is the, the, the protein coding section of the genome. And then we have been able to see differences that are accumulating not in genes specifically, but in, in gene networks. And we have discovered again the Neanderthals have things uh, related to phenotypes that we can start understanding. We have uh, genes related to skeletal uh, morphology. Probably some of the genes are expressed in the vertebral column. Neanderthals didn't have the lordosis we have in our column. So maybe these genes are associated to that. Of course, things related to the skin uh, and the hair distribution, uh, metabolism. And also there are some genes that have changed in the human lineage, and we still need to, uh, to uh, try to do a research on that related also to uh, kind of uh, uh, aggressive behavior, hyperactivity, etc. On the other hand, another surprise of the Neanderthal genome was to discover that we have inherited a significant fraction of their genome, especially all modern humans out of Africa. And this fraction is quite small, is about 2.5% of our genome, but involves also some, uh, some genes. Uh, the, the Neanderthal fraction, this is the, uh, you know, the, I, just, I only had the space for chromosomes uh, from chromosome 8 to 22, unfortunately, but in a single slide. Uh, but these are the, uh, in, col uh, in red color, the, the Neanderthal fractions in the Asians, and in blue, the Neanderthal fractions in the chromosomes of the Europeans. And you can see there is a quite a, a huge distribution of a small chunks of DNA that have been uh, incorporated in our genomes from the Neanderthals. Also very interesting is the sections of the chromosomes where there is a lack of Neanderthal fragments. So they are depleted of Neanderthal fragments, which probably implies that these sections, in, the genes in these sec sec sections, they cannot uh, accept, let's say that, uh, a copy which is very different from uh, from our genes. For instance, in the chromosome 8, you would see the long arm of the chromosome 8 clearly is depleted of many Neanderthal genes. Another hominin that came out is the Denisova hominin. Uh, this was discovered uh, the very same year of the Neanderthal genome, and the sample is this small bit of finger bone from an uh, infantile. Of course, it has no morphological attribution because it's too small. Uh, it's even difficult to know if it's human or what, but, but when it was sequenced, it produced uh, the whole genome of another thing, of uh, apparently a hominin that was living alongside the Neanderthals, but in Asia. And again, we found evidence of interbreeding between these Denisovans, and in this case, the Melanesians. So we now know that there were several events of admixtures of modern humans going out of Africa and mixing with uh, these archaic hominins and incorporating fragments of their genomes. And this is not just in modern populations, some extinct populations, some extinct modern human populations, like this skull on the left, uh, found in Romania very few years ago, it, it turns out that being a modern human, an upper Paleolithic uh, European, it has about 9% uh, of Neanderthal ancestry also. So clearly, what happened in, uh, in human evolution, and this is a, a change of paradigm of what was known just five years ago, is a lot of interbreeding events. And some of these genes incorporated from archaic humans, they have been selected in modern human populations. And that makes sense, because some of the genes that we have inherited from Neanderthals, of course, they were adapted for maybe half a million years to conditions that we were spreading out of Africa. And we, these conditions were, of course, new for our ancestors. And some of these genes could be real advantage. Uh, and one of these genes, some, uh, a group of genes, for instance, is related to the metabolism of lipids. 
in Europeans. It has been increasing frequency in Europeans uh, while they adapt to these high latitudes. So not only we have a significant but a small fraction of Neanderthal genes, but some of the genes clearly has been advantage for us while adapting to these high latitude conditions. Oh, and another interesting thing is we have now evidence also of the social practices uh, and the structure of the Neanderthals. Uh, for instance, these are uh, the Altai Neanderthal in chromosome 20, then 21 in top. You will see that it, there are quite a long tracks of homozygosity, which means that when you look at the chromosome 21, of course we have two copies of this chromosome, one from the father and one from the mother. They should have some variants. They, they are not identical unless the copies you receive they came from the same, uh, you know, the same um, um, ancestor. And this happens in consanguineous marriages, where you get the copy of the father and the copy of the mother. Maybe they came from the same grandfather, and then they are absolutely identical. And this translates in these long chunks of homozygosity. That means that when you look at the chromosome 21 in these sections, this copy and the other copy of the chromosome, they are absolutely identical. This, of course, is very strange and means this Neanderthal in, in particular, it has a lot of consanguinity. And it could be some combinations, double first cousins, half siblings probably is the most plausible. Uh, some, of the, some are a bit monstrous like grandfather and granddaughter. I don't think it's possible because they die very young. Uh, but no, but, but it, they are clearly saying that the very last Neanderthals, they had accumulated lots of consanguinity because probably they were few and few and few, and at least they, you know, they, they, they ended up um, having marriages with people that were clearly in kinship relationships. So we are now understanding not only the adaptation of the Neanderthals and their long-term evolution, but also things related to the social structure and the demography, because extinction at the end is about demography. And now in the last five minutes, sir, let <laughs> make a, a jump to more recent times, because now is, is, a, is a field which is now, uh, I would say, moving faster to, to more recent times. And then we are now studying what happened when the human population is established in each continent. And one of the things that happened very recently and clearly is a revolution in many aspects, not only demographic aspects, but also evolutionary aspects, is the development of farming. We are at the end the survivals of the farmers, and we, we make disappear the, 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 the style, the, well, the style of, of life of the human lineage for about two million years, which is the hunter and gathering. Of course, this, this is a, a depiction, again, of hunters and gatherers in Europe uh, 8,000 years ago, before the arrival of the farming. And again, I have to say this depiction is wrong. What happens in the farming? Uh, there is a, a huge increase of demography because the people can become sedentary. The people produce um, food uh, thanks to the agriculture. The diet changed a lot. It, it became based on carbohydrate diet. Uh, and there are new social organizations, of course, and more importantly, new um, infectious diseases that we, uh, we uh, have obtained, let's say, from the domestic animals. So most of the infectious diseases that has modeled our genomes and still affect ourselves, they come in fact from different domestic animals. So one thing what, uh, we did one year ago only was to retrieve the first complete genome of a hunter-gatherer from Europe 8,000 years ago. So one year ago, we didn't know how the hunter-gatherers in Europe were. How do they look? And this was an accidental finding in Leon, here in Spain. And we got several surprises. The first of all, um, we discovered that these genes that are involved in the light skin pigmentation in modern Europeans, uh, this person had the African variant, the ancestral variants. And therefore, this person, they didn't, he didn't have light skin color, but darker skin color than modern Europeans. And this was a surprise, because it was assumed that the lightest skin color was something very old. It has a meaning related to the vitamin D and the UV light, 
and therefore it was assumed that something that was maybe 50,000 years old. No, this person 8,000 years ago still had dark skin color. This gene was discovered in zebrafish, which is quite funny. I mean, the, the, they, they isolated the gene some years ago uh, through the study of this, of this fish that had the, the stripes much more clear than, than, the, uh, than the normal zebrafish. Another thing we discover is that the hunter-gatherers in Europe, they had blue eyes. They had the mutation that is still present in modern humans, especially modern Europeans, is the same mutation, and they already had this mutation. So they have a very surprising combination that doesn't exist anymore. Of dark skin, we don't know how dark. It doesn't mean it has to be extremely dark, but darker than modern Europeans and blue eyes. I put here a couple of actors from different uh, TV uh, you know, series in, 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 in the States, and this is uh, CCI, or the other is um, Anatomy of Grey, I think. Uh, but this is kind of a, a, is a, kind of a, a, a trap, because these people, they have an, in North America very mixed ancestry. So they have a grandfather who is Afro-American, another who is Cherokee, and uh, you know, another who is uh, European. Uh, but we have to consider that these hunter-gatherers, they were genomically like, European, like modern Europeans, except for, this, for these genes. This phenotype, it doesn't exist anymore in uh, modern Europeans. And then now we have these 233 ancient genomes. In just one year, we have come from the first uh, ancient genome in Europe, and now we have more than 200. And this is still not published. I think it will be published next week, so you will need to forget this slide immediately. <laughs> but this is, we have been able to detect, thanks to these 200 ancient genomes, which genes have been selected in the last 8,000 years in Europeans. So Europeans, we are still evolving. In, fa in fact, we are evolving quite fast, I would say. And uh, there are a list of 12 genes that have increased in frequencies dramatically in the last 8,000 years. Some of these are really well known, like the pigmentations I have explaining, or for instance, LCT, the, the, the ability to digest lactase in adulthood. This is, the, is one of the most extreme cases of selection in Europeans. And some others are related to some disorders like celiac disease uh, and probably some protection against some infectious diseases also. And these all need to be still investigated. But we are now in the situation of understanding which are the differences in modern human groups. How do they adapt it to different climatic conditions as they are spread out of Africa? And this is just a very short list of some of the traits that we have found uh, that they're different in several populations of modern humans related to different alt uh, uh, adaptive traits. Altitude, pigmentation, uh, a lot of disease resistance, etc. And with paleogenomics, we will be able to trace back in time how these adaptations occur in the, in the ancient humans. And that's it. Thank you.